everyone. I'm Neza Alawi, CEO of Meshad, an international organization that empowers women on a daily basis through capacity building, networking, and leadership initiatives. Today, you're watching The Women's Advocate, our weekly show that hosts women who advance society and champion diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our guest today is Rebecca C. Wright, Assembly member representing the Upper East Side and New Yorkville and Roosevelt Island in New York's 76th Assembly District. Hello, Rebecca. Rebecca has been a lifelong advocate for women, education, and climate change. Rebecca is in the Assembly Education Committee. You champion our public schools and helped obtain more than $1 billion in the new state support. Your bills have been signed into law, implementing a study on consumer financial literacy requiring health insurance policies to include 3D mammography at no cost for the consumer. You've been encouraging greater representation of women on corporate boards and identifying how many policy-making positions are held by women in the New York State government. In response to COVID, you co-sponsored emergency legislation that suspend rent payment for small business commercial tenants and certain mortgage payments. Rebecca, you've been the first um, women to serve in our district. Can you tell us how it feels to be the first woman? Well, thank you so much for having me on your show today. I, I just admire so much all that you're doing with your organization. Uh, back in 2014, I was recruited to run for the uh, position of State Assembly on the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. A woman had never held this seat before, so the National Organization for Women and the Eleanor's Legacy Foundation reached out to me. There were four men running, and uh, they said, Rebecca, we're, we're looking for a, a qualified woman to run. I was currently serving on Community Board 8, mm -hmm. and uh, so I entered the race. And uh, I said, there's only four men. And uh, so here we are today, several terms later, and uh, just worked really, really hard passing legislation for the district in response to the constituent needs. But we do need to focus on more women getting elected uh, to office. Women currently represent under 30% of the members in the Senate and the Assembly in New York. We think of New York State is a progressive state, but yet we are so far behind with other states on the number of women that we elect to political office. So our audience today is here to listen to us and, and also see how they can help us create change. How do we um, get more involved, uh, sorry, how do we get more women involved in civil society and also running for office at all levels? Well, that's a great question, and like I said, the two organizations that recruited me to run, the National Organization for Women and the Eleanor's Legacy Foundation, uh, are organizations that work very closely with women, uh, encouraging them and training them to run for political office. There's also EMILY's List, which stands for Early Money is Like Yeast, and they generally support women running at the federal level. There's a group here locally uh, in New York called Tri-State Maxed Out Women, and they uh, are a pack. They encourage women to write checks, so it's not just men that are writing the checks, uh, and they recruit and train women to run, and then they fund them through this Tri-State pack. And uh, they've been a strong supporter of mine. Hillary Clinton is hosting a, an event for my reelection on Monday night. Right. And uh, so there are numerous organizations out there, such as the organization yourself, that promote women, encourage networking, and provide support. Thank you. Uh, we feel honored to be represented by you because um, as individual organization, as women in the corporate world, business life, and, and as politicians, we always need to look up uh, for women who are running like you and, and feel that we're supported um, by, by women leaders in offices like you. So this year's election is very particular through COVID and, and through all the, the, the massive stress and uncertainties that are going on, how can we um, engage our audience um, of women to, to support more votes, as every woman can be a micro-influencer in her own community? 
Wow, that's, that's just such a terrific question. Uh, this past July, we made a lot of changes to the uh, election law after we saw the mistakes that were made in the June primary of people not getting their ballot until in the mail until after the election. Um, back in the last presidential election, there were long lines wrapped around the block of people waiting to vote. So we listened to the feedback that we got from voters and we tried to implement some new laws. So now, for instance, you can go right online to a portal at the New York City Board of Elections and register to request your absentee ballot. It comes with a confirmation number and a tracking number. My office has handed out hundreds of absentee ballot applications. If you don't feel safe mailing it through the mail, you can just, the governor signed an executive order a while back where you can drop it in a drop box mm -hmm. at early voting. Early voting starts on October 24th and it runs for 10 days and there is a drop box there so you can deposit your absentee ballot at the actual voting place or you can simply just put it in the mail. If it doesn't have enough postage or any postage, the law now says that they still have to count your ballot. So we have made an, a number of changes. Um, and so we're in, I think, GOTV right now, which stands for Get Out the Vote. It's no longer the election day of November 3rd like we used to know it. It's right now. As I'm out in the streets every day campaigning, people are saying, I've already voted absentee. And so people are voting every day. Great, so no excuse for anyone. So um, could you talk to us about your interest in sustainability and environmental issues? So I received a 100% rating from the New York Conservation League uh, for my environmental record. We've sponsored some of uh, the Clean Water Act legislation and we've held numerous shredathons on the Upper East Side in Roosevelt Island. Uh, recently I featured on one of my government town halls an expert on composting. So we're educating people to recycle and to practice com uh, composting and shredding and we're literally putting tape on the sidewalk. The shredathons are so popular, six feet apart, so people actually practice social distancing while they're shredding. Great. So you do believe that as citizens, as New Yorkers, we can make a difference? Absolutely. We all have to do our part and I think just consciousness raising and awareness is a big part of it. Great. So, Rebecca, I'm a mother of two daughters, and uh, schools have opened with uh, varying degrees of success, of success. How are you ensuring that we're protecting teachers, workers, students, and families? So, I, on the, the public school opened um, a few weeks ago, and I went out there at 7.30 in the morning and met the principal and the parents as they were dropping their kids off at PS290 and spoke with the crossing guard officer. We have supplied grant money for a new HVAC system in some of the public schools in our district and handed out thousands of PPE equipment to make sure that our schools are safe. Rebecca, women have a lot on their place right now. What more should we be doing for women who work to ensure their mental health? So since COVID hit um, in the end of March, I've hosted 29 consecutive Zoom town halls. We launched Town Hall Tuesday. And one of the things that I devoted one of the town halls to was mental health mm -hmm. awareness and what we can do. Right now, October, we're in Battered Women Awareness Month. And so this next town hall on Tuesday is featuring battered women experts in the field. And so to support each other with mental health, we've had mental health doctors, experts from our local hospitals, um, as well as yoga experts mm -hmm. uh, over positive mind and body. It's just been such a traumatic experience with this national pandemic. Uh, people staying in their homes, not able to go out, homeschooling their children. So it's, it's just so important uh, now more than ever that we support each sure. other with mental health awareness, healthy eating habits, healthy recycling habits. Uh, COVID has affected every single aspect of our lives. So what are we learning about how COVID has impacted our neighborhoods and more lar large on a national level and on a global level? So every single aspect of our life has been impacted from the way we educate our children 
to the way we eat out at restaurants, um, to the way we work. Now I'm sponsoring Zoom bombing legislation. Everybody is on Zoom and it's just a new way of life. And so COVID I think has affected every single aspect, even to the point of when you go to the hospital, you would go through a tent screening process out in the parking lot. And so what we need to insist on for New York State is more federal relief money coming out of Congress. And so one of the things that I've been doing is writing letters to our congressional representatives, asking them to urge the president to issue that relief money to New York State so that we get more assistance that we can provide to the people and to our businesses. Can you talk to us about the bill that you have passed on having free mammography for women? Sure, so um, recently I spoke at the National Health Convention on the 3D mammography bill, uh, tomiocentesis. Some of my best ideas for legislation come from my constituents. I had an elderly woman that literally came in our storefront office and said, Rebecca, my doctor has ordered a 3D mammogram. My insurance won't pay for it. I can't afford to pay for it. So I said, you know, I'm going to go to the Capitol. I'm going to go to Albany. I'm going to introduce a bill and we're going to change the law on this. And it's now a national model that's being replicated around the country. So the next time you go for your mammogram, ask for a 3D. Great, thank you. Rebecca, what do you have to say to <coughs> millennials and, and Gen Zs and this youth that is growing up in the Upper East Side and the, the areas around your district? Um, what do you want for them? I want them to have equality and justice and a safe environment and a safe country. I have a daughter that's uh, in college and a son that's in college and I try to encourage them to always stand up for their rights. Recently our government office was the victim of a hate crime uh, anti-Semitic attack. We held a press conference. We've now introduced legislation to strengthen the hate crime law, working very closely with the district attorney's office. So what I try to encourage our young people and as I travel around to the both public and private schools in my district, mm -hmm. I always say don't be intimidated, don't be afraid, fight for your rights. And um, remembering the late United States Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg mm -hmm. uh, and some of her great quotes. I recently published an article on her life uh, as an op-ed in the Irontown newspaper and she was famous for saying women are never going to have complete equality until they're recognized in the Constitution. So I was pleased to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in the New York okay. State Constitution but still we have so much more that we need to do. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, is there any bill that you're working on currently that you would like to share with our audience? Oh, I have numerous bills. <laughs> <laughs> We could be here all day. Well, so the Equal Rights Amendment bill has passed the Assembly. Mm -hmm. It has to pass two consecutive sessions in a two-year cycle. It also has to pass the Senate. It doesn't require the governor's signature because it needs to be put uh, as a referendum before the people for a vote. So uh, I am still continuing to fight for that passage in the Senate yeah. and then pass it a second time in the Assembly and then it'll go as a referendum. So that's one of my priority pieces of legislation. And then of course the Zoom bombing uh, bill that we're doing and the hate crime legislation. Those are my top three priorities right now, as well as continuing to fight for more dollars and more relief for our communities. Our office is fielding calls every day, people needing help with their unemployment claims, mm -hmm. with their landlords, uh, and a way to reinvent themselves professionally because they were let go from their job. And so providing skill services. What do you think and, and what is your belief when it comes to um, entrepreneurship? I think that we need to encourage entrepreneurship and we need to, um, I regularly refer people to the Small Business Development Center so they can write business plans and apply for business loans uh, and I think we need to really encourage more entrepreneurship particularly among women and again I just want to commend you on your organization and its mission and focus. I think that um, you know what you're doing for women and for empowerment is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. I think that 
um, we all have to, to advance society hand, hands in hand and uh, not expect everything from representatives and actually be supportive with the civil society. So uh, it was an honor hosting you today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It is a, a challenging time, but also a time full of hope for the future. Um, it was great hosting you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Neza Alawi, CEO of Meshad, an international organization that empowers women on a daily basis through capacity building, networking, and leadership initiatives. Today, you're watching The Women's Advocate, our weekly show that hosts women who advance society and champion diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our guest today is Lorraine DiFranco. Lorraine is a journalist, anchor, and a mother of two, as well as an artist. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so thank happy to you. be here talking about empowering yeah. women, which is a gonna, subject yeah. near and dear to my heart. Totally, and I feel that we're going to have a lot of fun today talking openly on all the challenges that women face when they have to advance their careers, or in your case, um, being in the media in front of the camera all the time. So how did you choose to become a journalist? Well, my passion for writing has always been there. I've always loved writing. And um, I did want to be an actress at one point. But my parents said, we're not going to pay for college if you become an actress. So I said, well, how can I combine my writing, my love of writing, my passion for people, and my curiosity of people, and being in front of the camera? So I decided to become a journalist. and. Um, I always wanted to be a witness to history and as a journalist you get to see so many incredible things in your life. Um, for example, covering the Pope or covering major moments in history, covering 9-11, all these things which you are an eyewitness to historical events. It, it's really an incredible thing. I, I am sure and, and we'll get to talk more about how you covered 9-11. Um, you chose to become uh, a journalist. And um, how was it as a woman to be facing the pressure that women face when they are in the media and how they are being selected to become an anchor? Well, I started out as a news reporter. And um, I was told that I probably wouldn't make it in the major markets because I wasn't blonde. And I didn't look like the quintessential anchor. However, I was very uh, persistent and I, had, uh, I grew up in an Italian family with two brothers and I was always competing with them and showing them that I could do what they could do, only better, <laughs> they would say otherwise. But um, So I, I knew that I wanted to do something, I was determined and I knew I could get there. However, there is a huge emphasis on your appearance in the news business, but you also have to be smart and articulate and curious. And, and so that persistence and that belief helped you go through it and make it. And I think this is a great message to the women that are listening to us, younger generation, uh, women in transition in their careers, um, to, to, to keep reminding them that with the right persistence and a little bit uh, ignoring the gender gap and just getting over it and believing that they can make it, they will make mm -hmm. it. Well, I never really thought of myself as um, facing a gender gap. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of put that aside and said, I'm a woman. I can do anything a man can do. You know, obviously there are differences, but I always felt that I was an equal. And I always try to present that way because it is hard. You know, men do make more money. They do get farther along in their careers, and um, there's ageism in our society where women aren't respected at a certain age. 
Um, I, I totally relate to that, and I've been advocating for women for the past decade. And um, my own journey has been to really totally ignore the limits that I had as a woman, and uh, also grew up with the with the brother, and just you know being a tomboy out there and turning mm. into this young women that wanted to change the world. Um, then I had my daughters, and we can talk about it too because you you are a mother of two and uh, the responsibilities that we have as a mother. But every time that I spoke to women from our generation that made it through, it was always women that ignored the fact that there was a gender gap. But then when we get closer to statistics and numbers, that's when it's really scary how we feel like almost like survivors. How, how did we make it through if you knew those, those numbers? That's why it's important f for us to advocate. T tell me, um, a little bit about your responsibility as a mother and, and how do you feel about that? Well, I'm a single mother of two teenage girls. Um, I have a 13-year-old and yeah. an 18-year-old and um, the most rewarding part is knowing that they're brilliant, they're smart, and they're well-adjusted. And to me, that's very rewarding and I know I did my job as a mother even though I did have a very high-profile career. I had to take a step back at some point and say, I want to be a mom. I want to take care of my children. I'm going to put this career to the side because what's important to me is raising my children at a certain time. That's not to say that I didn't have a great career and I kept doing it on a different level. But as a mom and as a woman, you do have to make those sacrifices. Yes. What people don't understand, men don't really have to make those sacrifices. I mean, they do now more so, but women really have to make a choice sometimes. Totally, but um, di didn't you wake up also every day trying to think that you need to be an example for them as a mother uh, of, of course. young women. And my, I, I would go out to snowstorms in the middle mm -hmm. of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning and put on snow gear and mm -hmm. drive my own car to the satellite truck. And my kids would see this. And you know now they're like, Mom, you, know, you were really cool. <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. I, I love when they say that because mm -hmm. you know, during that time, I was just trudging along and going through the motions and sort of raising my kids and being at every parent school event and then having the live truck come and pick me up at Turkey Day, mm -hmm. you know, and it was crazy. It was frenetic and it was, but I, I think I did a good job of juggling. I really do. I'm sure you did. Mm -hmm. And there is a feeling that is common to women all across the world. It's guilt. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've been raised with that feeling of guilt. When we become mothers, we grow that feeling of guilt uh, with us. What do you have to, to say about that? Well, I think there's always a tremendous amount of guilt. Even as a single mom, I try to shield them from ever having boyfriends or anything like that because they're so possessive over you. And then you feel like, you know, you leave for work and they're like, Mom, but I need my lunch. and I. Well, mac and cheese, <laughs> but you know, you always have that feeling of guilt. But I think that if you try to create a balance and you try to explain to them that mom has to work, I'm doing something that's beneficial to me, and you'll understand this in a few years. That's my classic line. That's you will understand <laughs> someday what I sacrificed, but it sounds a little, uh, you know. Woe is me, but no, it is, and, and they will, they will. I'm sure they already understand it. Um, you talked about balance. We'll get back to this. Um, Lauren, you're amazing. You're also an artist on top of being a mother of two and a journalist and anchor. Um, tell us about how you became an artist and, and what is your conviction behind it? Um, well, I was an artist from a young age. Um, I always loved illustrating and I did cartooning. I was a, a cartoonist in college. I did a daily paper, which combined journalism because it was mm -hmm. current events. And um, I went to the School of Visual Arts for a little bit. And then um, well, I went through a difficult period of my life and I started really getting into big canvas art again because it was very emotional for me and it was a way of pouring out my emotions on you know, a blank slate, mm -hmm. basically. So that's how, and my conviction is just expressing, you know, the feelings and emotion of life. I always say, when I'm really happy, my art isn't so good. 
but when I'm really sad, my art is amazing. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say amazing because no artist really ever, you know. Well, art is, is sensitivity and sensitivity goes with vulnerability. And, um, and another um, point that we like to, to bring across um, at Meishat is that vulnerability is not a weakness. It's part of what makes us stronger and mm -hmm. makes us uh, evolve. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear that and that you could turn that sensitivity and vulnerability into a beautiful uh, art piece that has been successful because you've been uh, uh, represented by art galleries in New York. Well, I, I've donated to um, causes in New York. Mm -hmm. I donated to um, Art for Joy, which um, Amariska Hargitay is the founder of that, I believe. And it's about healing through art. So it, I thought it was a great thing to donate my artwork wow. to. So when you talk about healing, it takes us back to balance. Um, what do you have to say to women out there on, on your own personal journey of the self-healing and keeping that balance across the different aspects of your life? Well, I would say that um, there's always going to be obstacles in life and you're always going to go through bad times and it's an ebb and flow of life in the universe. And there's going to be bad times, there's going to be great times, there's going to be times of uncertainty like now. And you have to just keep going and pushing forward. And life isn't, you know, what we thought it was going to be when we were kids. And, you know, we had the happy ending and the fairy tale princess and someone's going to come and save you on the white horse. You know, you have to tell your children that no one's going to save you but yourself. You're going to, you know, you have to save yourself. I have been analyzing a lot um, how come I, I didn't personally go that route of waiting for the Prince Charming to save me and, and why was I always that little girl with a lot of personality that wanted mm -hmm. to make things happen for myself and one point that comes to my mind is that as a child growing up with a brother I watched Winnie the Pooh and Bambi and not the stereotypical uh, uh, girls Disney show that were picturing that mm -hmm. and I, I do believe in, in that type of influence and, and thank God we're seeing the content of media changing and I'm sure your daughters have already seen a content where girls were warriors and, and <laughs> um, out there right it's a different the world. it's a different narrative now for sure it is. But I, I grew up with brothers and I really credit them for, especially, well, both of my brothers, but I had a brother who was really tough on me. Mm -hmm. And he taught me how to play pool, he taught me how to ski. Um, he would always give me tough love, so to speak. And I, I credit him because he made me a lot tougher and a lot more resilient. And, and I always had drive, but, you know, you always have to have that little drive nudge. Drive and resilience. Mm -hmm. So you covered 9-11 and uh, that's such a unique and very sad historic moment here in New York and mm -hmm. around the world. Um, I was in New York when, when COVID started and as New Yorkers, we were all shocked and trying to picture what is the closest shocking moment that happened. I'm sure you've heard a lot of comparison with 9-11 and uh, you have your point of view on that. Well, I think during 9-11, we all felt that, you know, the world was ending for, for a moment in time. And it was probably the most horrific and tragic event of our lives that we've seen this um, act of terrorism uh, on our soil, which, which was devastating. We lost people in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I was actually pregnant at the time. So, um, but we as a nation, I just remember those, those images of we came together and, you know, uh, Mayor Giuliani and, you know, it was not political. It was, we are Americans. We are all together. And um, in this time, we're dealing with a lot of different things, with the pandemic and with the political landscape as it is, and people not getting along and being divided and not talking to one another over politics. And, and the pandemic is, is a is really uh, interesting because we've never, you know, we haven't seen this since yes. the Spanish flu. So um, we have to look at it as we don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, 9-11, we had a, a time of, you know, it was terrible, but we recovered. 
Now we're going to have to reinvent the wheel. We don't know what's going to happen. I, I agree. And um, there is so much trust that, that we have in New Yorkers. And then we always feel that as a New Yorker, we are somehow stronger. Um, I come from an international background. And I was always fascinated by New York because whether you're the taxi driver or uh, a corporate person choosing New York out of all the cities in the world, uh, it will always make it that it's more difficult, but the, the, the energy, the adrenaline is going to be bigger, so it's not made for everyone. So I do believe that New Yorkers will get back in shape. It is a very uncertain time, but um, we'll do it. Um, I think you're right about that. Yes. New York always historically comes back, and comes back. New Yorkers are a tough breed. We've seen, yes. we've seen a lot, and people who want to live in New York, they're there for a reason. Yeah, yeah, and it's not a city where you can fake it. You can't no. just be. Um, if you can make it there, make you can make it, it anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> Great, uh, Lauren. It was an honor to have you, um, and and I hope to to really uh, host you more in our organization. We're going to. Oh, thank you. I would love to. I'm really yes. um, very, you know, interested in ways to empower women and ways yes. to get out that message that. Women yeah. are strong and women are important and, and their voices need to be heard. Totally. And, and your story is so inspiring. And Thank you. When, when we speak, we, we just don't know how much impact. I think we're not aware of how much impact it has on others. Um, so, so please, we'll organize uh, more occasions to meet again. Great. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>